Hello again, John Flynn here from Flynn Real Estate, serving Southern Ontario, based out of the Niagara region. Thanks once again for tuning in. This week, I want to start off with some stories from you viewers and just actually a couple other people too from Twitter, just about the reality of people, affordability and trying to get into the market and renting and whatnot. And actually, I want you to share your stories with me because I kind of want to showcase them and highlight them so people can like hear and see real world situations and what's happening out there. I'm here to promote home ownership for average hardworking Canadians. So I'd like to hear back from you guys and uh, I'd like to highlight it on the channel here. So here's a few examples of what I'm talking about. This was from Twitter, a girl named Ashley. The Toronto rental market is truly hell. My cousin and a friend are looking for a two-bedroom apartment and keep getting outbid by people offering a year's worth of rent. Someone casually dropping $38,000 of their savings on a rental in Midtown. So, of course, after all the money they pumped into the market, people have $38,000 sitting in an account, right? Uh, and it takes time to work that through the system. Here's another one from Kyle on Twitter. John, from someone who is younger and worked right out of high school, zero debt, almost six figures for a down payment. It is absolutely ridiculous seeing how expensive it is just to get a house, completely priced out, and I'm not willing to take on an $800,000 mortgage at 5% rates. And it is ridiculous. When I bought a house, I left high school. I was 26, actually, when I bought my first house, not because I couldn't afford one, because I didn't want a house. And then one day I decided, yeah, I want a house. And after a year of saving, I bought a house. So yeah, it is ridiculous. Here's a comment from Vintage Kitty on one of my recent YouTube videos. She was responding to the lack of inventory and my point that a lot of homeowners aren't selling. And she has to say this, well, I'm definitely in the same category as the first group of people not selling. We want to expand our family and get a larger home, but we will not overpay and screw up our lives in the process. It makes no sense for us to increase our housing costs, but then lower our income due to maternity leave. So no, we will not move until the deal is just right. Not participating in bidding wars or paying $1 million for a fixer-upper because of FOMO. I'm in the same situation, Vintage Kitty, minus the maternity leave. Another comment on one of the recent videos from Woozle Wuzzle. I'm planning to leave the country next year with my family. There is no hope here for the housing market. And what's worse is our industry has only shrunk since 2008 due to the high cost of living in Vancouver. A lot of people left either own a home or are desperate for any work. The saddest thing is my husband is in the top 5% of income earners and we pay a lot of taxes. He doesn't even have a family doctor anymore. And what do Canadians say to us instead of looking at things and saying we need to do better as a country? Don't let the door hit you on the way out. Yeah, that's, that's shameful that people would say that. It's I guess that's people. Another person from Twitter, Rohana Rezel. My family is going through our third non-fault eviction since Justin Trudeau became prime minister eight years ago. Our rent will go up by $1,100 at the new place. And the only action we see from the housing minister is that he's adding to his rental portfolio. And you're correct. The housing minister, he's busy with his rental portfolio, managing them, creating wealth and what, whatever he's doing. And of course, his agenda 2030 that he's involved with, with his other job. So yeah, he, he doesn't have time to really help Canadians by the looks of it. Uh, he's, he's got other things going on. So let's get into some data now. I posted this on my Twitter earlier this week, but I've expanded on it now. I'll show you in a minute. But this is the Canadian average MLS residential sale price by year. Now in Canada, unfortunately, we only go back to 2005 with accurate reporting because our MLS systems weren't really implemented till then. So there's not a lot of data before that or, or accurate data. It, it's very chopped up prior to this. So my point this week was interest rates go up, prices come down. Interest rates go down, prices go up. It's very simple and it's pretty much 100% guaranteed. So now let me expand on this and add some arrows to the prices going down. So starting from the left, you have interest rates going up. And you see a little bit later, prices dropped in 2008. Yes, we had a financial crisis. Well, that was more in the States, but still, even in the States, prices went up or sorry, interest rates went up and the average prices come down. The next time interest rates went up was in 2010. They went up and you can see uh, 2012, the prices leveled off. They came down actually a little bit just in 2012, the average price point. Next time was in 2017 and 2018, interest rate hikes started happening. And in 2018, the average price declined over the previous year. And even in 2019, it was still lower than 2017 prior to those interest rate hikes. 
And of course, our current situation early last year, they started hiking interest rates massively. And of course, we all know what happened after that huge price correction. Some people think that it's over. We've reached a new bottom. And I say, no, this is just the beginning because until interest rates start dropping, prices will not recover or they won't go up. They'll continue their downward trend. And again, you can compare that back to 2006 there when they hiked the rates and they had those rates elevated for at least 18 months at the top. And we have a lot of people betting on the future, betting that we're going to go back to those ultra low rates. And here, if you look at, listen to this clip, this was just from last week on the Bank of Canada's update. Tiff Macklem is very clear. I think the key message in this report is, uh, yes, we've raised rates rapidly. That was needed to control inflation. Um, and going forward, you know, nobody should expect that interest rates are going to go back down to the you know, very low levels that we've seen over the last decade or so. So we're, we're in a transition period to a world where interest rates are going to be higher than, they, than what many people have gotten used to. So maybe this time he'll be telling the truth. I guess we'll see. Now I want to show you the reverse of what we just saw with the interest rates going up. We're going to look at the interest rates when they go down. Same chart, the green arrow starting from the left. Bank of Canada drops the interest rates all the way back down. And look at the prices start going back up. 2014 into 2015, they dropped the interest rates just a little bit. They were already pretty low. And of course, prices keep going up. Then, of course, you have the pandemic in 2020, dropped the interest rates down to the rock bottom, and prices just took off to the moon. So it's pretty much a fact that interest rates and house prices are directly correlated, and it's like 90 to 100 percent. It's probably 100 percent, but nothing's 100 percent, so I'm going to say 90 to 100 percent. One other thing I want to look at on that same chart is the time frame from when those rate hikes started to when the market reacted or the market saw the changes in house prices. So back in 2005, it took about 18 to 24 months of those rates before we saw house prices decline. Then in 2010, it took about 12 to 18 months. 2017, just a short hiking period, it took less than 12 months. In 2018, yeah, I remember we saw house prices come down very quickly in that time frame. And of course, now we've already seen it, but it's not over. Looking at the next chart will show us why I strongly believe it's not over. And this is the duration. This is U.S. data. But again, we don't have much data in Canada, so I have to compare it to something. So this is the duration of U.S. housing downturn. All those big gray lines are the recessions. And of course, our recessions pretty much line up with the U.S.'s. And you can see the length of the downturns range from 27 months to 70 months. And if you look back at the 1965, 1975, and 1985, all those little spikes were the times when house prices started to decline for a bit and then recovered. But then they were followed or preceded by the bigger period of declines in, in house prices. And you can see where the U.S. is now. We're a little bit further ahead. They're eight months into it. We're, what, 14 months or so into our downturns, maybe 15 months, depending on what province you're in. And all those downturns are directly correlated with recessions. They actually usually start, the housing downturns start before the recessions. The only exception is that one that shows zero there. It's the dot-com bubble, which had nothing to do with housing. And of course, the beginning of the pandemic, which was a very short recession. It's uh, technically probably shouldn't be called one, but um, anyway, it is what it is. And the last chart is from Fred in the States. Again, this is US, but it shows, I just want to show you the correlation between house price declines and recessions. Going back to the first one prior to 1975 on the left here, you can see house prices leveled off, maybe a small decline, and then the recession hit. 1980, house prices started to decline, and the recession came. Of course, house prices declined right through the recession. The late 80s, early 90s, House prices started to decline, and then recession was declared after that, and they declined right through it. Dot-com, not applicable to housing, and then the great financial crisis, wherever they, it was called, house prices were declining for, I think, two years prior to that. And, of course, once the recession came, they kept plummeting right through it. And, of course, we are where we are now, and you can probably guess what's going to happen. I haven't heard any talk of recessions, have you? <laughs> Both of those charts, the links are in the description if you want to check them out yourself. So lastly, before I go, I want to kind of show you another dose of reality. 
And this is about houses being sold over asking. So I wanted to just show you a couple of examples. This, these prices and this data is from House Sigma because I'm not probably allowed to show mine on here because we have agreements, but this is readily available to the public on House Sigma. So just a couple of ho homes I found and kind of just some background or the stories that have been told and the reality of these stories. So here's the first one, 56 Belmont Ave East in Kitchener. It sold for 160,000 over asking. Listed at 599, sold for 760. Great story to tell, right? Well, let's look at the reality of the situation. It was listed for the same price as a two bedroom condo, and that was a detached house. It sold for market value when compared with other recent sales in, this, in a similar neighborhood in the same city. And it would have sold for probably $100,000 more a year ago since the market in that area has dropped by almost 20% on average. So I guess it's fair to say, instead of saying it sold 160,000 over list price, it was actually listed 160,000 below its value. Next property I wanna show is in Hamilton, 143 Barons Ave North. This one sold for 139,000 over list price. Listed at 499, sold for 638. Actually, sorry, it was listed for 139,000 under its value. So that detached home in mint condition was listed for the same price as a two bedroom or two plus one bedroom townhome in the same area. Similar homes in that area currently sell between 580 and $670,000 and it would have been worth about 15% more at the peak of the market last year. This was on the first house I showed from Kitchener. This is the comparable I used that's saying this is market value. They both sold for 760. This one here was listed at 7999. They had to negotiate what almost $40,000 off to sell it for a reasonable price. Whereas the other one was listed way under and of course they get the bragging rights. Now I know I've been in those situations and I have been part of this. I, we had no choice last year. We had to list because if you didn't list low, no one would come look at the house. They would think you want more than your $7.99 or whatever it was you listed at. So you, you had to follow the strategy. Now, the strategy now is optional, but I don't like it. I'm not a fan of it. No realtors are a fan of it. Now, does that strategy work? I don't know. It's hard to say, right? I'm sure a lot of the times it does create a higher sale price for the seller, but it's at the expense of the buyer. So, you know, you have 10 offers, you know, most of them are a lot lower than the winning bid. The winning bid is usually, you know, 20, 30, 40,000, $50,000 higher than the next highest one, especially in a market right, like right now where it's not the strongest market. Anyway, that's my thoughts on that. And until next week, I'll see you then.